This is the Final Whistle Podcast from the Wrexham AFC media team. Hello everyone, <clears throat> welcome to another Ask Wrexham. I'm Mark Griffiths from Wrexham AFC and I'm delighted once more to be answering your questions on the club that we love. And as you know, this is the way to contact us. So during commentary, please use the hashtag ASKWXM on Twitter. And we will endeavour to answer your questions about the game or about the club or about anything you want. And this podcast, of course, is partly to highlight some of the best questions that have come in. And also, because in order to mop them up, because you send in so many wonderful questions, we struggle to get round to them all during a match day broadcast. So let's kick off as we mean to go on. And this is one that is particularly pleasing to me. So Michelle Olsen asks, Mark, in an Ask Rex, will you please tell us more about Geraint and what he has done? Sounds fantastic from the reply comments, but wondered about more specifics. Yes, well, Geraint Parry, Wrexham's club secretary, got an award <clears throat> before the match on the pitch. It's an award from the Premier League to community captains. Um, I can tell you, never has an award been more justly given. Uh, because he is an absolute smashing bloke, salt of the earth. Now, he and a couple of other uh, top fellas, Dave Roberts and Phil Jones, came in in the 80s as fans to help out the club with its programme. Now, they were all interested in programmes, they're all football obsessives, and they basically produced a programme for... Oh gosh, it must have been getting on around 25 years, I'd imagine. And the standards they brought in, they collected their own group of volunteers like they were in order to, to pull the programme together. I'm proud to say I was one of those volunteers for a bit as well. And the production values were outstanding. The club would constantly win the best programme for our division every single year. And I seem to remember, wasn't there an overall one which we, we monopolised as well? Because it was just such a labour of love. The, the programmes under them were amazing. But of course, as you can imagine, in a club like Wrexham, which, you know, was not a big setup, they'd be pulled into all sorts of, of other areas as well. And they did wonderful, wonderful work for Wrexham. Although I'm talking about Geraint here, I'll just mention as well, I mean, Dave Roberts is a fantastic bloke. And he... Uh, did an awful lot of crucial work, including being an unpaid CEO during the takeover when the fans took over. That was an exceptionally difficult and delicate situation for a million different reasons. And Dave kept it all on track and did a brilliant job. And he is uh, the person I know in football who is the safest pair of hands, I feel, who if you threw him a difficult situation, he would handle it. But Geraint is cut from the same cloth as well. Geraint's amazing. Now, he was taken on as club secretary. And essentially, until the takeover, the Robin Ryan takeover, that is, that, that kind of meant he ran the club. He would just do everything. If you need to know anything about any football regulation or uh, advice, quite frankly, on anything, or who to go to in the club to sort something out, or anything about the history of Wrexham, anything you want, Geraint Barry will know the answer. And he is such a charming and kind and friendly man. He is absolutely wonderful in every respect. And I'm delighted to see him get that award. Um, as you could see on the pitch at the time, you know, he's very modest. Uh, he didn't know he was getting the awards because, he, you know, he's not, not somebody who wants to show off in front of the crowds. An early Dragonheart was, was just an interview with him and was brilliant. Sitting down and listening to him chatting about stuff is an education, no matter what your background is. He's just the most fantastic fella. A lot of us, I'll be honest, were quite bothered by just how much he had to take on because he was doing everything. Register a player, that would be him. Sort out a way travel for the players, that would be him. Often for the fans, that would be him. He's just doing every single little thing. And it's wonderful now that we've had the takeover, that there's more staff in the club to, you know, who hopefully are allowing him to concentrate on, <laughs> on less of a wide range of stuff. But um, one of my personal favourite memories of Geraint is just sitting by him in away games, listening to him negotiating uh, with local pizza companies because the players would get pizza on the bus going back as a treat after the match. 
And so he'd have to get a local pizza company to deliver pizza at five o'clock to a bus outside a football ground. And it just can seem to completely confuse every single one. And he would just get to see some the lovely bloke. He'd be get so exasperated at the stupidity of these people whose only job is to take an order for pizza and then get it where the order said to get it to at a time, that time. Um, my favourite one was Alfreton. Um, when we actually saw the pizza place, it was literally around the corner from the ground. You could almost see it from inside the ground. And they didn't know where the football ground was when Garrett phoned him up. And so he's there having to explain from to somebody working in Alfreton, from Alfreton, working literally 100 yards away from where we were sitting, where he wanted the pizza delivered. That was a personal favourite of mine. A lovely man. A forgiving man, because I once accidentally smashed his laptop in a game. Somebody cleared the ball. I was heading from my face, being the greatest goalkeeper in the history of the world. I got my fists up while commentating, but I could only get one fist up. Because, oh, that's an unfortunate phrase. Because I was holding the microphone with my other hand, and I punched it straight into his laptop and obliterated it. He was awfully reasonable about it. Um, he's just the loveliest man. He genuinely is, and, and, and a top bloke. And there are so many stories that go around. You ask anybody who's had any contact with him about his kindness, about his support, and about his knowledge. Honestly, everybody um, has got a good word for him. Right, the next question is from Jim in Monticello, New York. He says that with the section of the stands empty for segregation, how would anyone know if I came to a game from Chesterfield or Bromley to put me in the away section? How is seating, away seating determined? Now, Jim, good question. Um, it used to be uh, much more rough and ready, but now, especially with online purchases, I, I guess there's more chance to, to regulate and control who would get into ground. So, for example, okay, to give you an example, how it used to be. I'd go to away games to commentate. My dad would come with me, being a massive Wrexham fan, and he'd always just walk into the ticket office and say, can I have a ticket near the press box, please? And because we weren't playing in, in sold-out stadiums, they'd, they'd sell him one. Now, OK, they may be making the calculation that he's possibly from Wrexham, he speaks with a Welsh accent, and he's with a bloke who's getting a press pass and signing... <laughs> the, but the form as from Wrexham AFC, but maybe they're just calculating that they're not worried about it. He's not going to cause trouble. He's, he's a man with white hair and a walking stick. He's going to be fine. He was only refused once ever. That was by Oldham Athletic. You said, we think you're from Wrexham. You'll have to go in the away end. That's the only time they did that to him in decades of going to matches. So it used to be as easy as that. And, and I suspect with a lot of, you know, sort of conference team, national, national league team, sorry, probably is still like that you probably still could um at, but nowadays at Wrexham certainly where there's such a premium on tickets and also where there's concern for segregation um it's not so easy so basically the away team will sell their tickets and if you're buying them online well, they'll have your billing details and if they see you've got a Wrexham postcode but you're trying to get into the home end or vice versa, they may well reject you. Uh, they would legally have the right to reject you on the door if you turn up in a big Wrexham scarf, for example. Um, but beyond that, I mean, you do see stories of people asking to get somebody to get them tickets for somewhere else. What was I heard at York? I mean, some clubs are going to be more hardcore than others in terms of applying it. York, the police were warning local people beforehand about Wrexham coming to town and there was something wasn't there about a Wrexham fan with a York postcode who wasn't refused a ticket I'm sure I saw that somewhere so you can have slightly awkward situations especially Britain being such a small country people do migrate and end up living nearer the team that they are playing against and the one they support but yeah generally it'll be the home team sells the home tickets the away team sells the away tickets um, if it's not an all-ticket match, and those are fairly rare outside the top level, then you can turn up on a day and buy a ticket from wherever you want to score the turnstile and pay. Um, but you need to keep an eye out for things like that. But yeah, you're quite right. I mean, theoretically, it could well be a way to, to craftily get into a game when the Wrexham end is sold out. 
theoretically i'm not saying do that i'm not condoning that oh i've done it a lot I, I i've been to plenty of away games where i like to be able to see what's happened and i feel sometimes behind the goal in the away and you can't see it as well and so shamefully i've gone and paid and gone into the main stand on the sides and i generally keep my mouth shut although my dad wouldn't my dad would quite happily chat to the old chaps around him he wouldn't at all hide his from wrexham He's not about to cause trouble. And then at half time, the <laughs> days before the internet, he'd give me loads of local intelligence because he's he's found out all these different things about the team and which players are playing well and things like that. So uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, play it smart is all I'm saying. Um, S. Janey Lightning says the tackle on Luke Young in the Solihull Moors game was crazy. What's the worst tackle you've ever seen? Yes, define a good slash bad challenge. I'll get to that in a second. That's a that's a wonderful question. That um, well, worst tackle I've ever seen. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm reluctant to bring up the really horrific ones. I mean, you see some horrendous challenges where players have launched themselves in off the ground and have gone through someone's leg and broken both the bones in their leg. You see terrible things with the, the leg, the ankles go floppy because of the disconnect. Oh, horrible, horrible. Um, so I think I'll stay slightly more on the light side. I, I, I hope I haven't said this before. If I have, I do apologize. When I was a kid, oh, I've got a bad deja vu feeling. I may have said this. I'm, I'm sorry, but I do have a bit of evidence if watching on video to back me up. When I was a kid, my cousin and I went to go autographs after a game. Wrexham had played Notts County. And Joey Jones, the great legend. Lovely man. Great player. Very tough. Um, had been playing against Notts County. And he'd, he'd like kicked a, a Notts County player like, like across the upper chest neck area while the ball was on the floor. It was outrageous. In those days, you wouldn't get sent off for that sort of thing. You virtually had to shoot the referee to get sent off. And then who's going to send you off? Um... And so we were waiting for autographs. There was a bit hot of an ambulance by the player's entrance for the player who was taken off with his neck in a, a collar um, onto the ambulance. And then Joey came out and said, lovely bloke. And <laughs> signed our autographs. And he said, oh, lads, put your hands out. And he, we did. And he gave us this. So if you're on video, you can see this. If not, I'll describe it for you. If I go back to my little um, shrine of Wrexham stuff in the backdrop and open up the treasure chest studs metallic studs joey jones gave me and my cousin his studs it was suspiciously like he was disposing of the evidence you know no i never kicked him and you'll find no dna on my stuff because he's distributed it to us that's my theory anyway um <laughs> It was a good one, that was. It was nice and high. Um, what's a good or bad challenge? Oh, my gosh. Well, that, that is a proper football debate, I've got to say. It really is. Um, because in, in those days, people, the rules were different and you could hit people a lot harder. Um, and essentially, you could essentially argue... I think this is the best way of explaining it. If you played the ball, then anything goes sort of thing. So if you smash into the ball... And you crunch the player and break his leg. Oh, I played the ball. And, and generally, there would be no problem with it. Um, in fact, to be fair to Stora, or it was a bad challenge and deserved a red card, I think that if you go back 30 years, that wouldn't have been a red card, you know. I may not have been given as a foul. He did play the ball and then went right through Young's leg. Um, nowadays, it was changed in um, the 90s. Nowadays, you... It's more the other way. If you play the man, it's going to be a foul. doesn't matter if you played the ball. They changed the rules for the 94 World Cup. Marco van Basten, an absolutely amazing Dutch centre-forward, um, essentially had to go into retirement when he was about 28, just before that World Cup. And a big part of it was that defend uh, referees weren't defending him. Defenders come up behind him, and they just kick his Achilles. And his Achilles, both of them, were just shot. Um, and he'd had operations, including one sort of sp experimental process, which went wrong, which apparently involved some, some surgeon who thought he had some new technique, sticking a metal ball on a stick into his Achilles and manipulating it, and just made it much worse. Um, and so he had to retire early. And so for the 94 World Cup, they brought in the rule, you can't tackle from behind. And initially it was... If you hit somebody from behind, it's a straight red card. You kick someone from behind, red card, end of. 
Um, now that was a silly idea, obviously, because it depends how hard you hit them, doesn't it? And I'm not, don't get me wrong. I think it's it's a good principle, but you know, they slacked off from that after a bit. So I think it made its its point though, and that for me is a starting point of this alteration of the rules where you know you, you need to win the ball cleanly in essence not to have a foul given against you um you see this with other initiatives if you watch the last world cup you know they're in 12 minutes 15 minutes i've added time onto each half that didn't last long did it people get bored don't they got bored of one hour long halves and they started to ease off that so yeah what is a good tackle what isn't depends on your Vintage, possibly. I, I, you hear a lot of football commentators who are a bit old-fashioned saying, "Oh, they should have." The the in my day that would have been fine. I I'm inclined to go a more, bit more towards the modern way of thinking. Uh, I, I, some people argue that you're taking the physicality out of the game. I wouldn't want that to happen, but I do think that you shouldn't be able to just kick talented players to stop them playing football. So I. I I lean more towards the modern interpretation than the old interpretation. Some of the tackles you used to see were absolutely wild, I promise you. In school, by the way, as I'm a teacher, it's quite interesting. A kid said something to me a couple of weeks ago, and I, I didn't know what they meant. And when they explained it, I've got to be honest, I loved it. Um, this lad said, oh, we were playing on the yards, and this lad, we did the right Brexit tackle on me. I said, like, what do you mean? It was Brexit, wasn't it? He, he, he could have broken my leg. So Brexit, uh, the kids are, uh, are using as an adjective to describe sort of old-fashioned, um, thuggish behaviour <laughs> sort of thing, which is rather amusing. And then they explain further, and I've had this verified by my lad, um, like a Brexit footballer will be a basic old-fashioned one, like without much technique, but just relying on brute strength rather than subtlety, skill or intelligence. That's a... That's a that's a beautiful use of language, that is. Commandeering a word to mean something else, but keeping the essential essence of it. Superb. Now, Lou Sue says, listening faithfully from Pennsylvania. Oh, thank you. Wonderful to hear. Does Aaron Hayden have a nice, secure contract? I fear some higher tier team's going to try and take him away. He's under contract till 2014. 2024, not 2014. Stop living in the past, Mark. 2024, so the end of the season after this one. That's great. Wrexham have been good at jumping in and getting players to sign contract extensions as well. As people like Mullen and Young and Davis have. So that's great. So, yeah, it looks pretty secure. Let's be honest, the length of the contract remaining means you can ask for a higher fee. So it's not as if we can't lose him for his um, during his contract. But if someone made a bid from now, we're in a position to say he's got 18 months of his contract left. You're going to have to give us a lot of money. Um, the problem for football teams comes when players have less than a year of their contract left. At the end of a contract, they're allowed to leave for nothing. And then you get into some rather tricky situations where players might refuse to sign a new contract and you have to accept a lower bid. So hopefully there'll be news of an extension coming through. But yeah, year and a half anyway. So we've certainly got him securely for the moment at least. Let's move on to Jim again, who says, uh, why is the cop called the cop? I, I, and I, I did say on Twitter, I, f I felt like I'd answered this on Ask Rexon, but I can't find it. So... I'm assuming I haven't. If I have, I really apologise for going through this again. Just skip the next couple of minutes. Right, 1900, uh, Britain is engaged in the Second Boer War, which is a war in South Africa. And basically, there is a battle. Cop is the Afrikaans word for hill. Spion is the word for spy. So the Spion Cop was a hill in South Africa which was used to spy on people because it's very high and very steep. And what happened in this battle, let me give you a picture of the hill, if you're watching on the video, um, is that the British troops arrived with when there was fog at night. Uh, nearby is the town of Ladysmith, which was under siege, and these troops were coming to relieve the siege. They used the fog to climb up the hill in order to get a good spot so that then in the morning when the fog cleared they could attack and they could shoot from the top of the hill and obviously they'd be in a very advantageous position. But tragically for these soldiers, 
it turned out that when the fog cleared, there was a bigger hill behind it. And the South African troops went up that, and essentially it was an absolute massacre. Uh, the British troops massively outnumbered the South Africans, but lost, and a lot of them were just killed. It was a, it's a very rocky hill, and when they tried to dig trenches overnight, they couldn't dig them very deep because it was so rocky, so they only dug it one or two feet down, and essentially when the fog lifted, the South Africans just shot them in the trenches where they were. They were pretty much sitting ducks. Um, so it was a big military disaster for Britain, which in 1900 obviously got a reputation and a lot of um, attention. And so when British football clubs started building big terraces, they called them Spion Cops, which has generally been reduced down to cops. The famous one um, was Liverpool's, and Liverpool's cop. Uh, there's a newspaper report at the Times talking about it being a great mound of earth because, of course, in the old days, that would be more what you'd get at a football ground is building up a bank to stand on rather than an actual stand. And so the famous Anfield cop, and again, if you're watching on video, that's a picture of the cop in the old days. You still have the cop, but it's seated now. In those days, it was standing. And it's a terrific sight seeing all the crowds in there. I have been on Liverpool Cop when it was all standing, and it, it, it could be quite... a uh, a feisty and remarkable experience, uh, although worryingly sort of tight with the people around you as well. Uh, but yeah, the cop was a was a, a terrifically famous place, and also traditionally the cop in the ground became where the loudest fans would gather to sing as well. And so they they it'll be like the most lively part of the ground. Now Sheffield Wednesday, wonderful picture I got up there to show Sheffield Wednesday's cop. That's before the roof was put onto it, and it's a wonderful illustration of why they would call things like this spy and cops after this famous hill in South Africa, because wow, it just does look like a just a mass of people going up and up and up forever. Um, it's a real incredible bank of of people, it's very steep as well. Um, other famous cops, well, Wrexham's. And a picture up now of Wrexham's cop when it's absolutely full. That's one of our European matches. And so, you know, maybe not as steep, but still a, a nice big uh, terrace. Uh, there's another picture there. That's from a famous game when we beat Spain. Wales beat Spain uh, at the race course. Mass, massive people was rising up. So that's why they're called cops. Um, also speaking of cops, Jarvis said, what's the timeline for the cop redevelopment? And is there much sign of demolition going on yet? Will there be a big wall built behind the goal? I don't know about the plan for the wall. There's a small wall already, and that may well do the trick. I remember when they rebuilt the old road stand, they had a wall about the same size as the one that's there now. The demolition is due to start this month. And as for the timeline, I think, haven't they said 2025 was when they wanted it? And Jarvis was saying those were the days, by this time, it felt like it was going to fall down underneath us. That's the, the famous Boston game where Wrexham rescued themselves on the last day of the season. First, last crowd we've had at the race goes of over uh, 11,000, 13,000 there, with the cop packed out. Uh, it was a remarkable day, although, ironically, we went down the next year, it didn't count for much. Um, Jason R. Koivu says, as a new Red supporter, Harry Lennon's a mystery to me. I understand he's supposed to be good, but he didn't look it against Scunthorpe. If you have time in your next Ask Wrexham to shed light on Lennon's past, present and potential future, that would be appreciated. My, my absolute pleasure, Jason. Um, I agree with you. I think your, your reading of that game is correct. Uh, Lennon didn't play that well, but I think there's a reason. Um, basically... We bought him at the start of last season. He was one of Parkinson's first signings. He'd been playing for South End in the Football League the season before. He tends to be plagued by injuries. His history going through his career tends to be that he's had injuries. And I think he'd be playing at a higher level were it not for the fact that he has consistently got injured and not been able to complete a full season. Now, when we brought him in... He hadn't played for quite a while, and I was a little concerned that, you know, okay, having not seen him, you think, he may, he may well be good, but are we going to get him on the pitch? Now, we've spent a lot of money on the physiotherapy department in terms of bringing in good staff and expanding it as well. And it, to my eyes, I think they did an excellent job on Lennon. 
last season. They got him up and running. They got him going. We got a good half season out of him. And he looks quality. He has an awful lot of good attributes. And he really felt like a player whose progress had been hampered by injuries rather than a lack of anything else. He's got genuine ability. He's very quick. He's strong. It's funny, you know, the first time I met him, I realised how tall he is. I didn't think he was quite that big because he's not a huge, broad build like Hayden and Toza. But he's as tall as them, if not taller. And he's, he is good in the air. He scored a couple of goals from set pieces as well, like Hayden does. Not not in the same volume as Hayden, but he's got that threat too. He passes the ball well, which is important for the way Parkson wants to play. You can see how he fits into that pattern. But the problem was he then did break down with injury again. It ruled him out for the second half of the season. And so as a result, we've basically given him a one-year contract. So we've not given him sort of job security, really. But we want to see what he can do. We want to see if he can actually get fit and um, play. So, fingers crossed that he'll be all right. Um, I think the reason he played well, uh, not so well against Gunthorpe, he looked very rusty to me. He made the mistake, of course, early on. It was just like, just, yeah, just not quite up to the speed of the game. I think really when you miss a lot of football like that, it does affect you. As it went on, I thought he did some good things. Um, but I just thought that looked like a, a rusty footballer. He's not played in nearly a year. Um, but we've given him a year's contract to try and work on him and try and get him right. Because if we do get him 100% fit, I think he's got a very good footballer there and a good footballer to take us up to higher divisions. Because I think he would fit in perfectly comfortably in the Football League, League 2, League 1, comfortably. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the thinking, Jason. Um, I do think he's player who if you can get him fit I don't know if you can but if you can get him fit and up and running is a bit of a class act I wouldn't judge him just in that Scunthorpe game the other thing oh sorry the other thing about that Scunthorpe game and it was something that made it harder work for us than maybe it ought to be and of course is those players aren't used to playing with each other so he comes in but our style of play is altered a little bit he's got different players to get used to and just those little subtleties I know people will say well he must have been training yeah absolutely but it's not quite the same as as playing so I think there was also that as well so I don't judge him on that game I, I assure you if we can get him fit he'll come good um oh I love this Gareth spending the year in Norway for when I first read this I thought it said spending New York in Norway and I got very confused I went to the gym which turned out to be a distance from the hotel looking like a lunatic in shirts and shorts at minus five degrees but it was a Wrexham shirt so it's okay not as cold as the 13 final against Grimsby by the way that's so true yeah the Grimsby game at Wembley was quite something but hey but he asks and I like this what's the highest latitude Wrexham officially played at Love this question, not least because the answer to diehard fans might not be totally surprising, but the order of the top three might be. So, first team games. Right, most northerly game, comfortably, was in against Djurgardens in Stockholm in Sweden in 1975, European match. So that's the most northerly game. The other ones in the top three are Lundby, who are a club in Copenhagen in Denmark, and, wait for it, Rangers, Glasgow Rangers, we played in the mad Tunnock's Caramel Weird Cup thing that we were in a couple of years ago against our will. Ask a separate Ask Wrexham question about that. If I try to address that, we'll be here all night. Now, the surprising thing is that, yeah, obviously, Djurgardens in Sweden is the most northerly one, Actually, despite the appearance on, or maybe that map does show it, Rangers is slightly higher than Lingby. So it's Djurgardens, which is 59 degrees north, and then both Lingby and Rangers' grounds are 55 degrees north, but Ibrox is just slightly higher. So, wow, well, yeah. So, funnily enough, the second most northerly one is in Britain, even though we've played a couple of games in Scandinavia. My God, I'm dull. Right, Mark Chappers. People seem to use Parky for both Parkinson, our manager, and Parkin, our assistant manager. The players only seem to call Parkin that. Who is the real Parky? As we explained in the commentary, the real Parky is Andrew Parkinson, who was commentating with us and has been commentating with us for donkey's years. So yeah, that's, there's only one Parky. I hope that's an acceptable answer. Um, I guess the players don't call the manager Parky because he's above them 
often the tradition is that like assistant managers and coaches are more with the lads and are sort of a conduit to the manager and the manager has sort of been slightly aloof and so like talking to a teacher you wouldn't call him parky you know so i guess that's the I guess that's the logic look britain's like that football's like that nicknames if your name's parkinson you're gonna get called parky end of it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how many other parkinsons are around you're gonna get called parky and that's that <laughs> football 366 mark how's the pitch today that was no solid hole match any worse or wear after freezing temperatures we're just coming out of the ice box here in swansea massachusetts right well um it was good it was very good um the, the cold snap i mean those two games that were called off were unplayable there's no way you could have played but once you got over the cold snap it's fine that's i suppose the beauty of our temperate climate so you can get four can four seasons in a day as the cliche goes but when you have bad weather it can end you know pretty sharpish and then you're just back to something very different so that cold snap once it ended everything was fine again i thought the pitch looked slightly tacky in the scunthorpe game uh, which is totally understandable because it had been under the covers for days um but by uh, the south solly hole game it looks absolutely back to top level uh, again, as I always say, the grand staff are outstanding. Charlie's brilliant, and it's nice to see after decades of you know having to scrimping and saving and going begging supporters association for for cash to buy bits of equipment that now they've actually got the a proper nice pitch to work with and good equipment to use on it it's really really pleasing to see that and they're rewarding us with good pitches as i said i think in last week's arse waxham on the pitch as it used to be before the last couple of years i think we may have seen more games off this season but it's a good pitch this one because we spent a lot of money on it and, and it's being maintained with good equipment and good people so that's good that's good news all around how many times can i say good in the space of 10 seconds personal best um brant saying about the solly hull game i think this is the first time i've heard music in the background over the public address and it was songs by the specials are they a fan favorite or was this a taunt against solly hull which is close to coventry oh man now this was answered on twitter for you brant so i know you saw that but i want to address that anyway um that is uh, firstly can i just say right that the, the, the solly hull being near coventry thing definitely isn't a thing but it's brilliant thinking that so often is what happens in football and it's great that sort of just a crafty little dig into a club by doing something like that so i love that i love that you spotted and worked that out but it isn't in this case um and it isn't a, a fan favorite thing um although um so two-tone scar stuff has been used in some places and become very popular wolves famously played um what's it called liquidizer before matches um and so that you know there are some clubs where that happens uh it's a bit weird scar isn't it because a lot of scar music became popular with football fans at the time of two-tone but that's because of that strange dichotomy of scar tending to be an anti-racist movement celebrating music from the caribbean that was incredibly popular with skinheads who traditionally were the the most racist people you'd come across um and, and there's that um you know band members of the specials and selector and all these different bands have talked quite a lot about this this weird sort of um experience of people who, who seem to be have all the trappings of a racist loving their caribbean music um and there was a link there between football fans and hooligans often would be seen skinheads that was also a, a look for a hooligan and so there was a weird sort of link and crossover which is slightly difficult to explain in in some ways wolverhampton of course not that far from coventry mentioning wolverhampton as a club that you scar um, and on a more pleasant level as well as that there's a there's a real cultural crossover between music and and football i mean liverpool are sort of given the that's the sort of idea that they invented singing at matches um fans in the 60s gathering on the cop and singing beatles songs for for an hour before the match um and there's always been this this close relationship between music and football on this occasion it was a classy tribute to the fact that of course sadly the lead singer of the specials terry hall died last week in fact i, I think i saw somebody mention they also played music by faithless and was something i can't remember 
So there were a couple of records played as, as tribute to people who died in the last week who were hugely influential in British music. Um, Luke Perry, I like this. After, after the Solihull match, I have the feeling that this is the sort of team Parky's been trying to build for a year and a half. Now having Mendy, Lee and Young all being creative means Palmer and Mullin are freed up to just cherry pick. I feel like this is how the team was built to play. Mullen can create an opening, but he doesn't need to anymore, and can be fed uh, then to just tap, <laughs> to just tap them in. Um, ha Hayden and Palmer did the same and just finished the goals in free play. No corner requires. Yeah, I am inclined to agree. I think definitely you can see transfer window by transfer window how Parkinson's been building things up, and now it looks like a properly complete team. Certainly in the in this first gap between windows he wasn't able to get the deals done in time and we did well just to keep ourselves in contention and then once Palmer McFadden O'Connor came in although O'Connor got injured you could see that pieces were being slotted into the jigsaw and you can really see how the likes of Tunnicliffe and Lee have lifted the first team how Mendy has you can really see that Ford uh, you can see that how they contribute so yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a there's a real sense of progression with Parks. I quite like that. I I used to feel the same with Andy Morrell on in terms of tactics that you could understand and see what we were trying to achieve, and and you could judge it more easily. You know, um, you can see quite clearly. I think in terms of his signings and in terms of his tactics and in terms of his strategy, what Parkson wants to see out uh, on that pitch. And I think that's interesting. Luke also asked the question, could that team trouble Coventry? Yes, definitely. I mean, look, they are three divisions above us and they are at home. They are heavy favourites, don't get me wrong. But we have got players who are certainly League One quality, if not Championship quality. Um, we have got a lot of confidence. Coventry are doing all right as well, mine, so you know, I'm, not, I'm not underplaying them. It may well be that Coventry will decide that this is a game they could rotate their players around. How much squad depth have they got? Because we won't. And, you know, a slightly inexperienced or weakened team against this Wrexham team will need to be careful. So it's a cracking tie for loads of reasons, but we definitely have a chance in this game. No question whatsoever. Um, Kurt Bennis put in a thread which was a lovely summary of the match and one thing he mentioned was whether having 11 against 10 on, against Solihull was responsible for the last three goals and I wanted to address that because it's a good question some teams cope well going down to 10 men Dean Keats had a remarkable record when we had a player sent off um, and I think part of it is that sometimes teams go too defensive and I think it's wise not to Solihull did didn't re well. They, you know they kept their five defenders on the pitch and didn't look to change from that. And it felt like it was more they knew the game was gone and it was sort of damage limitation. Um, did it mean that's why we got five possibly? But I think we were in comfortable control when the sending off took place. We were forcing them into mistakes, so I think we would have won by more than the two. Um, so it's it's sort of unprovable either way. Um, there was a famous example of us going too negative in a game in 20, I want to say 15, could be 16. It's definitely that season when the manager, Kevin Wilkin, I thought went a bit too defensive. We were winning 2-0 against Altrincham. We had two players sent off, but they had a player sent off. So we're only one player down, but we really played like it was 9 against 11, packed the box and just waited for them to score. And in the end, they came back and beat us 3-2 at Wrexham. The thing is that I remember Manny Smith, who was a smashing defender for us, but was not a player who went forward naturally, at one point got the ball and just went charging through the middle of the pitch on his own. It was really something he wouldn't normally do. But it was clearly he was so angry and frustrated that we were defending so deep and, and essentially waiting for Altrincham to pick us off that he just wanted to sort of send a message. Let's get up the pitch and try and do something here. And of course, in the end, he charged up the pitch. He did really well. He beat a couple of players and there was nobody else with him. Nobody came with him. And he lost the ball in the end and he came back muttering away quite rightly. Um, so yeah, sometimes I think maybe teams' mindsets are not quite right. Although to be fair, 2-0 down and down to 10 men against a dominant team like Wrexham who were really making them look bad anyway at that point in the game doesn't feel like when you're going to take risks. I think that game is gone then, isn't it, to be fair? Um, Karen Biggs, oh yes, I wanted to address this. We had to move the streaming and she was asking why it was moved. So basically our commentary is on Wrexham player 
and we had to move it as an emergency to Mixler. It's good that we have Mixler, which is an online app where you can broadcast live audio as a backup. Um, the reason what actually happened, um, and I'm going to explain this simply because I hope this gives you reassurances <laughs> as to how secure we are. Um, we are on Wrexham Players part of the Football League's platform and there are lots of really genuine benefits for the club of being on there, especially if we go up. But um, it uses ISDN lines for audio commentary. Now, ISDN lines are obsolete and they will all be switched off in 2025. The Football League hasn't brought forwards an alternative yet, which is a bit frustrating. So it means we're using old kit. It's not sold anymore, obviously. Nobody will service them anymore. And hoping for the best. Uh, the BBC use them as well, interestingly. or They're, they're moving over to uh, more modern ways of doing it, but they do use their ISDN lines. Now, the thing is that for some reason, absolutely inexplicable, it just wouldn't dial out. I phoned the people at the other end uh, on we, who operate the platform. They tested the lines. They gave us different numbers to call. The, they felt the lines were definitely working at their end, and I had the same problem every time I would phone up. It's always a, again, you know, and it's always the same pattern. It would ring usually. It rings three times and then connects automatically. It rang four times and then hung up. I tried different numbers that they gave me. Exactly the same pattern. I tried three. Oh, hang on a second. Let's be honest. Let's be straight. Yeah, that's right. Three different cables to connect to the ISD endpoint. I tried three, no, four different ISD endpoints, all of which were live, two of which were the BBCs, and thank you to them for trying to help us out. But I got the same problem every single time. Um, and I got, I actually tried two different kits. We actually have a kit, or two, yeah, weirdly, two different ISDN mixes. And so I tried them. And I tried every combination of all of that. And you got the same results every time. It's worrying uh, because I can't see any explanation. The BBC guys were wondering... Oh, no, sorry. The guys at the other end were wondering if there was a problem with the BT exchange at the ground, which makes sense, except that the BBC got through. You see that the lines are split, if you will. So they have two ports you can plug into, but it's the same line. So if they could get out... Surely it isn't the local exchange. Anyway, all, I can, all I'm saying is that we would never do that and move from Wrexham player unless we'd exhausted all opportunity, all possibilities. And as you heard then, we really exhausted all the possibilities. It was so frustrating. And part of the reason why we didn't get on to some of the Ask Wrexham stuff because we, we pretty much went on air <laughs> you know, at the la you know, with about five minutes before kickoff once we'd resolved that we've got to go on Mixler. So the, I had no time. I got there really early as well, annoyingly, and then spent my whole time trying to connect and didn't get a chance to do the sort of last-minute bits of prep that allow you to be set up to do things like Ask Wrexham. So I'm sorry about that. It was frustrating, but hey. Well, hopefully I've answered a few questions now anyway. I'm off. But remember, Solihull Moors game, that's a big one. If it hasn't happened yet, I hope we do well. And, uh, right. I'll see you soon. Don't forget to use hashtag Ask Wrexham if there's anything you want to know. I'll do my best to try and let to help you out. I'm Mark Rivers from Wrexham AFC. This is the Final Whistle Podcast from the Wrexham AFC media team.